here today to listen to um, a wonderful story and uh, from a very talented woman. Um, I'd like to welcome Salama and David Furlong. Salama Miller Furlong was born and raised in the Amish country in Ohio. Driven by her desire for freedom and a more formal education, she broke away from her Amish community not once but twice. Why I Left the Amish is about the first time she left, and its sequel, Bonnet Strings, A Woman's Tie to Two Worlds, is her second. Saloma graduated from Smith in 2007 with a major in German studies and a minor in philosophy. Her education has included research on the Amish with Donald Craybill and a semester abroad in Germany. She's presented talks about the Amish in libraries, colleges, universities, and conferences throughout the country. Saloma is joined by her husband, David, today, who wrote part of Bond Strings from his perspective of the Yankee romance we'll all learn about. So today, I'd like to welcome Saloma and David. I'd like to also let you know that 10% of the seals from Saloma's new book, Bond Strings, goes to the Friends of the Library, and Saloma is also one of our friends of the library. So please welcome warmly Saloma and David. <laughs> of me writing my story and telling my story for a long time. So Bonnet Strings is a culmination of, um, you know, the, the being on, on American Experience twice and also my first book. And then finally, this is my second book. So um, it's great to be here today. Our talk today is called Torn Between Two Worlds. In my first book, Why I Left the Amish, I told of my childhood and my young adulthood until the time I was 20. When I realized I needed to leave home, I decided to go to Vermont, even though I didn't know anyone there. I had been introduced to Vermont through my seventh grade geography book. And then later, I also um, subscribed to Vermont Life magazine. I changed my name to Linda, dressed in English clothing, and had my hair cut. With a suitcase in hand and $400 in my pocket to start a whole new life. Once in Burlington, oh, I arrived at the YWCA in Burlington in November of 1977. And when I had stepped on, onto the train, the night train out of Cleveland, I had become Linda. Once I was in Burlington, I made new friends, and I established a social life. I went from cleaning houses, which is what I had been doing back in Ohio, to working in restaurant kitchens. And then I got my dream job. I became a waitress at Pizza Hut. <laughs> I struggled with having one foot in the Amish world and one in my Vermont one. I had no spiritual direction. And I believe that I had lost my chance of salvation, especially if I listened to the messages of my childhood. One of the main reasons I had left the Amish is to have a chance of continuing my education. Like all other Amish children, my education ended at the eighth grade. I made plans to take college courses, I e and then I eagerly anticipated what it would be like to re realize my lifelong dream of going back to school. I also began dating a Yankee toy maker and street peddler named David. <laughs> I would go to the Y to visit my friend Janie. One day I stopped in and Janie was gone. That was the day I met Linda in the kitchen of the Y. I 
had gone to the Y to see Janie, who wasn't there that Saturday afternoon. Maureen had introduced me to Linda and then taken off. Lynn and I were now alone in the kitchen. She took a pot of chickpeas off the stove and drained them in the sink in, a grace, in graceful, confident motions, moving about the kitchen in her bare feet. Her sturdy calves were barely exposed under a mid-length wool skirt. Would you like some chickpea salad, she offered. Sure, I'd love some. Linda moved about the kitchen, putting together the salad, adding the chickpeas and dressing. She served up a portion and handed it to me. There was nothing coy about Linda. This had to be the Amish daughter. She acted like someone who knew her way around the kitchen, was direct, and had the solid body of a working girl. She was my kind of woman, and I knew it instantly. Any remaining interest in Jamie dissolved in the clarity and simple charm of Linda. Linda and I talked in the kitchen for hours. When I had arrived, the sun was as bright and as high in the sky as it gets in January. When I got into my Datsun pickup to leave, it was dark outside, and I didn't care. I had just met somebody extraordinary, and I sensed my life was about to change. And my life was about to change, too. Two nights later, when I was going on break at work, David walked in the door. He sat with me as I ate my pizza. He started talking about taking Janie to Fairfax to see her boyfriend and how she'd open the door of the pickup when it was moving. I listened quietly as I munched on my pizza. When he paused, I said, you didn't come here to talk about Jane. <laughs> no, I didn't. Do you like Chinese food? Well, you know, I've never tried it, but I'd like to. There's a place down on Shelburne Road called the Tiki Garden. Would you like to go with me on Sunday? Sure I would. <laughs> I said this looking into David's ocean blue eyes, and then I realized where I was. After David left with his hands in the pockets of his pea coat, taking long strides down the street, I realized that he had just asked me for the kind of date that I'd always dreamed of, one in which we go out to dinner and get to know one another. Back in my Amish community, going out to dinner for dates was just not an option. The date at the Tiki Garden was my first one with David. Then, for seven blissful weeks in the deepest part of winter, we danced in the bars of Burlington. We dined in the restaurants. I prepared meals at the Y, and I shared them with David. We drove out into the country and talked for hours. And each of the dates was punctuated with schmunzling in the parlor of the Y. <laughs> then there was the best date of all. David invited me to go to a blues, bluegrass concert at the Ira Allen Chapel on the University of Vermont campus. It was late February, and it was one of the coldest nights of the year. As I sat snugly next to David in a pew, and listened to the old-fashioned foot-stomping, hand-clapping, bluegrass music. I thought back to those Saturday nights in my parents' home, where tension lived in the shadows. I realized that if I hadn't left, I'd be back there now, preparing for church the next day. Each of the nine people in the family would take turns bathing in the living room, next to the wood stove. By the light of the gas lantern, I'd be helping get everyone's church clothes ironed and hung up for the morrow. Just thinking back to those dark Saturday, wintry Saturday nights of my childhood, I realized that that was now a world away. I was grateful for this opportunity of sitting in the bright and airy chapel of David and enjoying the first music concert of my life. Little did I know that at that moment, there was a movement afoot back in my home community. The bishop and my older brother Joe and others were planning a surprise visit to Vermont 
with the intention of taking me back. Little did I know that one week later, I would find myself back in my Amish world. I would have to leave David and my newfound freedom in Vermont. The day Linda went back, there was no light in her eyes and no feeling in her voice as she said goodbye to me. She gave me the slightest of acknowledgments with a half smile and a half frown. She was pensive, quiet, and stern looking in her full length, gray pleated dress with a short black waistcoat. Her black bonnet covered the side of her face and it covered her hair. Her body was hidden in a veil of chastity even in my plight, I was aware of her startling beauty and natural grace the Amish clothing gave her. I sensed that she was torn in two, and yet there was nothing I could do to save her. The last thing Linda said to me was, By the way, my real name is Saloma. Before she turned and walked away, I believed her. She did not seem like the same person I'd know. The last image I had of Linda or rather Saloma, was with her sister, Sarah, and a friend, Ada, striding away from me. She was moving away from me as fast as she could. The morning after my return to my community, I awoke in my brother's house. I reflected on the sudden change back to my Amish world. I thought about all the things that I had to leave behind in Vermont. I would worked in exchange for courses at the Church Street Center. Now I could not have, I could not be able, would not be able to take those courses. There was my job at the Pizza Hut, and there were my friends that I had to leave behind. <clears throat> The hardest of all was the relationship with David. I sensed he, he was devastated when I left. I could not look at him at the Church Street Center because I knew that I would betray my feelings if I did. Though we never verbalized our feelings for one another, I knew that he cared deeply for me. Four months earlier when I left the Amish community, I made a sudden change from my familiar Amish life to the unknown outside world. But the transformation from being Amish to becoming myself as Linda had occurred naturally, because it was my choice. Although I had thought transitioning from the world of the unknown back to familiar surroundings would be easier than the other way it had been, I now realize that going the way of freedom comes more naturally than working against it. I wondered, is it better to have known freedom and lost it than to never have known it at all. I decided on the spot that the answer for me was a definite yes. No matter what happened, no one could ever take away those four months of freedom I had experienced. I got up and I pinned myself into my Amish dress, combed out my hair, and pulled it up and clasped it to my head, the very same way I promised the hairdresser in Chesterland just months before that I would never do again. Then I covered my hair with my cock to show my subservience to God and to men. <clears throat> Several weeks after Linda left, I received a letter from Salome clarifying our friendship. To me, we were more than just friends. She gave me her address and a phone number where I could reach her. I was thrilled and soon made plans to visit her. When I visited Linda in her Amish world the first time, I had the opportunity to experience her as Saloma. This was the beginning of a deeper, more profound understanding of her. I was introduced to a complex person in the austere world of the Amish. 
I felt a stirring in me, like an awakening. And she was in the center of it. Saloma and her Amish grace pulled my heart in deeper than it had been before. Yet she was only willing to offer me her friendship. I wanted more. I learned something important from David during his visit. We were sitting at the kitchen table at the Benders where I was living. And I said again, David, you know that all we can ever be is friends. Yes, but you do give me mixed messages. <laughs> like, what do you mean? Well, sort of like this and then that. <laughs> That is when I realized that David knew me better than I knew myself. When David was ready to leave to go back to his sister's house that night, I stepped outside with him and we looked up at the stars. He said, Could I give you a kiss? <laughs> no. <laughs> well, actually, you were supposed to ask me. You were, to, you were supposed to say that Oh. <laughs> I really enjoyed the evening. I hope I can, we can get together again sometime in the future. <laughs> it felt like someone had just started turning a paddle wheel inside me. David had conveyed his feelings so naturally by simply stating his desire to see me. If he was thinking of coming back to visit, did that mean he was my boyfriend? Did I want him to be my boyfriend? What, would, it, would that mean that he would join my world or that I would go back to his world? Where did I want to be? My uncertainty about the future and what I wanted it to be, along with all the shoots of my Amish life, were enough to make all my feelings royal inside me. It was so uncomfortable that I didn't want David to be there anymore, conveying his feelings to me. David's voice brought me back to the present, standing there outside, of, outside the Bender's house under the stars, after having spent an evening with him as a friend. David was asking, I wonder if I could have a kiss. <laughs> no. <laughs> How about a hug? <laughs> okay, I'll let you shake my hand. <laughs> That handshake under the stars was the most loving, the most tender handshake I'd ever gotten from anyone. It held a longing and a desire that I couldn't even name. be able to remember David's parting words. Only the feeling in my right hand when I was lying in bed staring into the starlight through the low windows of the bedroom where I slept. I was glad I was alone and in the dark with the feelings I didn't want anyone else to know about. I knew that if I was going to stay Amish, I could not have any doubts about that choice. The people in my community would soon detect any feelings of ambivalence. If people suspected that I was unsure, they would watch every move I made. I had to show them that I could be trusted before they would trust me. Except that I wasn't sure I trusted myself. All those feelings I had for David that I had wanted to tuck into a tiny little package labeled just friends insisted on spilling out and messing things up. My right hand still felt warm with the love that David had wrapped around it. I brought it up to my face in a soft caress, the way he often had when we were together. Then slowly the tears came. Oh, I guess it's still me. But sorry. <laughs> we haven't rehearsed this at all. <laughs> 
our, our very first talk together, so uh, bear with us. <laughs> I had no idea that there would be fallout from David's visit. People began admonishing me, telling me I should not have anything to do with those Vermont folks, lest that I should be tempted to leave again. The Benders did not want all the trouble surrounding my life, and so they asked me to leave. That's how I ended up at my brother Joe's house. And for those of you who have read the first book, you know what that means. The pressure from my community was pretty intense. And so were the persistent letters from David wanting me to stay in touch. I kept telling him, I'm Amish and you're not. Our relationship is impossible. I could not hold David close any more than I could let him go. One day, my two worlds collided when David showed up from Vermont for a visit, and I didn't know he was coming. I delivered a thorough rejection. When David departed, I did not know whether I would ever see him again. After this rejection, I did not understand why David kept writing to me. I felt deeply ashamed for how I treated him, and my pride got in the way of responding to his letters and cards and I was still trying to make myself Amish by teaching in an Amish school. Eventually, though, I realized that I was on the wrong side of the desk. I wanted to be a student instead of a teacher, which could never happen if I stayed Amish. I grappled with whether one can have a foot in both worlds, or whether you just have to choose between one and the other. Bonnet Strings is about finding this answer for myself. Now, we will take um, some questions, and, um, we'll, and you can direct those questions to either David or me or both of us. Um, we'll do that until about two, um, I'm sorry, three, so another 30 minutes or so. And then I have a final meeting that um, is basically about the turning point for me. Um, and I also like to mention, how many of you saw the Amish shunned this past Tuesday? Oh, quite a few, okay. Well, some of you, um, then those of you who, who did see the film, uh, Naomi Kramer is the woman who um, was on there representing the Amish Descendant Scholarship Fund. She and her cousin Emma were the founders of this, and I'm also on the committee. Um, her cousin Emma was at her own graduation at San Diego, at San Diego University. She had worked her, her way through college without any support from her family. And on her graduation day, she said she was so proud and so happy. And she looked out over the auditorium and she noticed that all her friends had their family with them. And so she found it really sad. And then she, the crowning blow came when she was asked to get up like all the other students, and thank her family for their support. <laughs> she said she just stood there. She, all she could do was cry. And she looked out over the auditorium, and she saw that her friends were crying right along with her. And she said, that was the day I decided I was going to do something to change this for other people. She started, that was how the, the Amish Descendant Scholarship Fund, or ADS Fund, was started. And she and her cousin Naomi started it, and then now I'm also on the committee. So if anybody feels moved to leave a, um, a donation, there's a box here for it. Um, so now who would like to start the, uh, the uh, questions and answers? Yes. I'm just curious, so what, what's your opinion? Why do you, I mean, I was li listening to your program on TV, it's very yeah. fascinating, very, very good. Thank you. And, they were saying that 20 million visitors pass through the Amish community. Is it every year? Is yes. It, what is? What do you think is? Why do you think it's such a draw? What's your feeling? There? That is the million-dollar question because I have puzzled over the question of what is the fascination with the Amish culture. Some people want to claim that they are like a model of a good society to us. They represent the, the, our past, our rural 
um, past that is, you know, close to the earth. And it, it's simpler in the sense that they have less technology to complicate their lives. Mm -hmm. So really, there is that whole idea. But I think there's something deeper than that. I think there's a, the Amish also, for me, represent a very quiet faith. I mean, they have a lot of problems, but they also have a very deeply rooted, quiet faith that they live out. And they do so without really wanting all this attention drawn to them. I think with our fascination for the latest fashions and technologies, our lives have come, just become just too complicated. And so they represent the alternative. That's the only thing I can say. I think the, the, uh, the culture has become hyper-individualized. We've forgotten how to come together as a community. The Amish represent community. Yes. So I'm wondering on your, when you first went back, mm -hmm. if you could expand on your feelings as to whether you felt, maybe in retrospect or at the time, coerced, or to what extent you went back willingly? I did not go back willingly. I was overwhelmed by the presence of the bishop, my older brother, my uncle who's a bishop, the wives of the bishop and my uncle, and my friend and a sister. They basically brought the troops because they knew that if you, they overwhelmed me, that I wouldn't go back. And with the, with the uh, history of my brother and myself, I did not trust that he would not physically put me, stuff me in the van to take me back if I resisted. And I finally decided, okay, if I'm going to go back anyway, at least I will go back with my dignity intact. But as I described, the morning after I went back, there was a feeling of entrapment. Oh my God, what just happened in my life? And um, it slowly, over the next couple of weeks, I became sort of acclimated to my life. And when I made, it's, this is described in the book, when I finally made the public confession that would then, and then they would accept me back into the church, I actually had a moment of grace in that. And I didn't expect that. That didn't last very long because I was criticized so much for having the connections in Vermont and not severing those ties and all kinds of other things. So it was a very, long, two years and eight months that I was back in that community. Anybody else? Yes. Um, you're, that was in Ohio, correct? Yes. What was your Rumspringer like in Ohio? Rumspringer for me and for... Well, in that area. There's so many things written about it in books that... And they're all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't know like, yeah. where the line is or right. where it is. Okay, so a lot of people think that Rumspring is a time when young Amish young people get to uh, go out and taste of the world and decide whether they want to be there or not. Not true. It was, Rumspringa is basically a time when you begin to, you join the young people's gatherings, you begin dating, and you find a marriage partner. And then, when you get married, that ends. It has nothing to do with tasting of the world. Yes, the, the parents and the elders of the church might look the other way if a young person has a radio on the sly, or, you know, drink beer, or race their buggies down the road, or something. But um, really, it's not, it, there, there's no, the pressure to join the church and become a member is always there. When you start reaching the age, and for me that was around 18, I was turning 19 that summer, and I knew the pressure was only going to get worse if I waited another year. So I joined. So they don't actually like have English clothes like hidden in no. the seat of No, I'm telling you, that is so wrong. It's really? not true. It's sneaking in radios? And well, I mean, some of them do, but it's not that the, that the parents sanction them. They, it's that it's still considered wrong, and the parents still want them to join the church. 
So, and, and in some in some Amish communities, it's more lenient as to what they do allow for during their dating period. And it's basically a dating period. That's all Rosh Hashanah is. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes. I have a place in upstate New York, and a lot of the Amish people started to move in there and start communities there. And and I'm trying to figure out how how they're governed within that little community. Like in the community I'm in, it, 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 that I'm familiar with, it's probably like eight families. Mm -hmm. And is there a bishop that like runs the whole show there? Or it how, how is, what's where, the government? Where, where it, in, in what town is this? Ellenburg, New York. Okay, I don't know that community. The way it normally works, if it's brand new, is that a, a few families will start it. Yep. And it only matters as to whether there is a minister, a bishop, or a deacon as uh, already ordained in their home community before they go there. Otherwise, if there's not, then what they do is they get together and they sing and um, do everything that they normally do in church service except there's no preaching. And um, until they ordain, then what hap usually happens is it grows a little bit more, and then um, at that at some point they will ordain a minister or a deacon or you know a bishop. And eventually, if it's a big enough community, they'll have a full a full set of elders: a bishop, two ministers, sometimes three, and a deacon. <laughs> um, How do you identify who that person is? Is From the outside, yeah. it's impossible. Okay. Unless you know them. If you know somebody and they're willing to tell you, then you will know. Otherwise, you won't. And my guess is that you're in the Schwartz and Trimmer Amish area. The Schwartz and Trimmer Amish are the most strict of, the all, of them all. So they have very little to do with uh, their English neighbors. Yeah, th these people are friendly with the English neighbors. They are. Oh, yeah, they'll, they'll, they Do you know where they came from? Uh, Fort Plain. Okay, that's a different, yeah. That's Lancaster, yeah. yeah. The, Fort Plain? I don't think so. I think, I'm not sure. Fort Plain, New York. New York. Fort Which Plain, is, New York. Uh, down near Utica, I believe. Okay, don't know that. It depends, it all depends on whether they're willing to tell you. Because yeah, I asked the, the one, the, the oldest guy mm -hmm. whatever. I asked him one time, I said, well, you know, you must be the boss of the aim machine. Mm -hmm. And uh, he says, well, some things we keep confidential. And so I just, you know, I just dropped that subject completely because they are friendly. And, you know, they help me, I help them. Uh, Sounds like he might be the one. <laughs> there's, there's, because normally they'll tell you unless it's him himself. Yeah, there's so, two or three you yeah. know, elderly. You might want to ask somebody else and then you'll know. Uh, <laughs> Anybody else? Yes. So, when they have a bishop or the elders, are they lifelong positions that they have? Yes, they're lifelong positions. They're ordained. Ordained means basically that um, at a communion service, when they are going to ordain a new minister or leader, what they do is all the bishops from uh, neighboring church districts will come and help with the. It's a very serious undertaking. Um, everybody in the home district, including the women, go past, file past the window and give the name of one of the men in the community who they think would be a good leader. That gets recorded, and anybody with two or more votes will then go into what they call the lot. Let's say there's six people in the lot. They put six books out, and in one of those books is a piece of paper. The person who picks up the book with a piece of paper in it is now ordained for life. <laughs> so they feel that it's God's hand is in the chance end of it. So that's how it works. Yes? I wonder if there's any aspects of your Amish upbringing that are present in your life today. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, um, for me, it, it really has to do with my spiritual, sort of, the quiet faith part of it. I don't really go out and talk about the way I feel about or my own spiritual journey. I have to know somebody before I can really 
give the intimate details of my spiritual journey. I also fe um, feel like I'm, I still practice off and on when I have time the homespun arts that I learned from my mother. And my home is fairly austere and simple. Um, I still dress pretty simple. I mean, Kirsten is my, is my uh, seamstress and personal dresser, as she likes to call herself. <laughs> and she's constantly trying to tell me, well, you know, that's not really in fashion. And I say, I don't care. <laughs> so she, she gets very exasperated at me. So I like, I like um, you know, I still have some of the, the same values in a way. Um, and there's some things that I miss from my home community that I can't replace. Things like the community aspects of, you know, like if I'm doing my homespun arts, I'm doing it by myself. Instead of getting together with a group of women who will do it with me. And so it's, you know, there are certainly things that I've missed, that I miss from the community. And what I can, that I value, I do bring into my life. And she makes the meanest pies on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yes, speaking of guns, Yes, Mary, you had a question. To what, to what extent, if you leave and you choose not to return, mm -hmm. to what extent is your relationship with your mother and father separate? Yeah, the shunning, which is what that film was about, is a very complicated, varied um, practice from one community to the next. And it's also sometimes very arbitrary. There are people who left in my home community, and their parents didn't really shun them. And, and the elders didn't say anything. But with my parents, they were harder on them. And so they would... Uh, criticize them when they first, you know, I, I, I described this in the film. When David and I first went back to visit, um, they would eat right with uh, We would eat right with them. And then apparently they were criticized for that. Next time we went, there was a car table six inches away from the big table, and my mother would just hand us food. And then they were criticized for that too, and so we just stopped eating with them but we still visited. We still visited at least once a year. And, um, you know, they weren't supposed to take gifts from us. Uh, we still gave them stuff um, on the slide. And they weren't supposed to do business with us or ride in our car, though they could ride in yours. Now, some, some Amish communities do what they call strict shunning. And strict shunning means that they basically um, cut off the ties. You're not supposed to come back to visit because they don't want the younger children or the other children in the family to be influenced by you. That's why Levi Shetler in the film, uh, why his family basically sat on the front porch and talked. They didn't want them, him coming into the house. And by the way, I heard from the producer of the film, she put out this little tweet that um, Levi, when he went up to visit, ended up staying an extra day to help somebody else leave. So I'm very, I'm very uh, intrigued by how it seems that the young men will help each other leave, but the young women seem to be on their own. I find that fascinating. Um, let's go to somebody who hasn't asked, and then I'll come back to you. Yes. <laughs> Can I follow up on that? Because sure. I saw, is there like a network? I mean, is there, there was the other person in the film who said had a place in the basement. Yeah. And for, for people. So yeah. Is there kind of a network? And, and also, they hinted the story about how you met Anna. So, is there sort of a network of people who have left that do assist? People there isn't really a network. There's, there's more or less, um, Joe Kine does have a lot of people come to him because <clears throat> through the young people they find out from each other who they can go to. He actually recruits people out of the Amish because he believes that they are lost souls. He believes that they are not born again Christians and therefore he needs to save them. <clears throat> so. His idea of what he's doing for these young people is very different from what I felt I was doing for Anna. I felt like I was just 
her liaison between her world and the outside world. Joe does that, but in addition to that, he feels like he ministers to them for their spiritual life as well. Um, there may be, I think there's maybe a few other people who take in young, uh, young former Amish uh, boys, and, uh, both men and women. Um, they're less, lesser known, and they're usually people who were never Amish, who just feel for them and take them in. Um, so there are, there's sort of like, if young people want to leave, I don't think they're as much on their own as I was when I left because it's happening a lot more. First of all, the population of the Amish is growing at such a rate that if you keep, uh, if, even if the retention rate stays at 10 or 15, you know, 95, uh, 90, 85 to 90 percent, you still have more people leaving because the population is growing so much. And so um, I think that it was less uh, frequent for somebody to leave back 36 years ago when I left the first time. Now I think young people have a, a clue that they can get some help. I think more so in the more liberal communities. Anna is an anomaly. She left not knowing anybody. The only contact she had with the outside world was when she was uh, selling vegetables and baked goods at the roadside stand. And, other, and now that she's back, the women in that community may not do that anymore because of her. So the women have almost no contact with the outside world. Um, yes? How do they, in a community like that, manage their finances so that everybody has what they need? Or... Did, did everybody hear the question? Okay, so their finances are basically their own, so each family has their own. It's not a shared um, asset community. It's different from the Hutterites who do that. They, they basically have a collective. But the Amish, every family has to fend for themselves. Um, as far as the finances for the community, the only thing that they share are things like hospital bills. They'll, they'll um, at each communion service, you give money towards um, other members of the church to help them out, whoever needs it for hospital bills and whatnot. But other than that, it's not a, sh it's not a shared uh, asset community. Yes? Do you think it's possible for the Amish community to exist and thrive without its isolationist tendencies? Wow, that is a very big question. I don't know. I don't think so. I think their being separate from the world is a very big tenet of theirs. Um, and I think the minute that they were, that they would uh, allow technology like we do, that their lifestyle would probably disappear. Yeah. So I don't think so. Yes. Do people ever leave later in life? Yes, they do. Um, I remember there was a woman named Fanny um, who left, and she was my mother's age. I was probably, I think she must have been in her 60s. So it happens very real, but it does, it does happen. Yes? I can't imagine replacing buttons with straight pins. Does that make injury? Do little kids, uh, I'm sorry for the <laughs> question, and are there any other, I mean, sources of injury or danger for the kids that we might not think of in our society? Being an Amish child is a very dangerous proposition. <laughs> um, especially back on the, the farm. Um, yes, Amish do tend to put their children in danger much more than uh, people in, in the dominant culture. The pins are something that you only need to use once you are an adolescent woman. The men get buttons on their shirts and, and their pants, but the women are the ones who end up with pins. Um, why? They don't want the women to be fancy? I don't know. I guess they think that the men don't care. You know, they're not into fancy buttons. I have no idea. Tradition. 
Again, well, it's not good with pins. <laughs> And by the way, you're right about that, because I'll tell you what, they, you could, if, if somebody, if there was an Amish man who you didn't want close to you, all you had to do was pull a pin out of your dress and threaten with it. He would back off so fast. So, but the, the, as far as, um, you know, the young girls do have buttons down the back of their dresses, and then when they become adolescent, they wear what they call a front closing dress, and that's when, when they start using pins. But there are a lot of other, you know, hazards. Um, I remember stepping in rusty nails when I was barefoot, you know, just, just things like that. So, yeah, it can be, it can be tricky. <laughs> So, do you have, is it okay to ask? Sure. Okay. <laughs> well, I was wondering, I've, I've been to the Pennsylvania mm -hmm. Amish seven times, and the last time I went was a long time ago. And I will follow them around, you know, I'm not, I try to be, you know, like I'm not really looking. But, because they notice the parts in their hair from pulling the hair so long, the parts get big. But I see that they buy store-bought cookies mm -hmm. and bread. Mm -hmm. And I'm picturing home making bread, mm -hmm. but they're buying white bread in the store. And this was years ago since I've been. Well, Is the Amish a lot of changes. Well, it, first of all, the Amish in Lancaster County are—they're um, the most open to tourism. That's why. I mean, you're you're part of the statistic. Yeah, I, you, I have. I want you to know. <laughs> um, but. The Amish are expected sometimes to be wholesome food, homemade, everything's homemade, but they are just as much junkies as anybody else, sometimes more. I mean, if you look at some of their recipe books, there's, they use a lot of jello, they use a lot of uh, cream of mushroom soup, and you know, whatever. I mean, it's like, the Amish are not wholesome when it comes to food, and they are very much into the starch, the sugar, you know, but they will also have homemade stuff, so it's a combination. Uh, yes, sir. Do the girls ever say, hey, how come I have to drop out at eighth grade and the boys keep going? The boys don't keep going. They don't. They don't. <laughs> See, this is, a, another, uh, this is another uh, myth about the Amish, is that eighth grade is, is where it stops for all for all young people. Yeah, I mean, I would have said that if the boys had were uh, keeping going. But instead, I knew that there was nothing I could do about it. This was just the way it was. And it took me till years later to realize that the eighth, going through the eighth grade is not even a rule in the church. <clears throat> it is so much a given. A rule in a church is something that the bishop goes over. Every uh, ordinance church, every twice a year, the spring and in the fall, he goes over every rule in the church. Never once do they mention the school because the minute you open that up or you say that, it's open for discussion. Not open for discussion whether your children want uh, to be on the eighth grade or not. So I find that fascinating that I. It, it, didn't dawn on me two years later that it is such a given that that is where it, that is where it ends. Yeah. Follow up on that. Then. It seems like they're able to provide a society without higher ed. Yes. Okay. Well, yeah, but they can't become doctors and they can't become nurses and they can't, you know. Yeah. I mean, but it's. They also use the doctors in our in the you know the, the culture beyond them. They you know when they go to uh, the hospital, you know they're depending on the doctor's skills just like anybody else. Yes. Uh, let's go to somebody. And then we'll, yeah, that. This seems like a weird question, but if they were in Massachusetts and they only went to eighth grade. Would they still have to pass the MCAS? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, I don't even know what MCAS is, but doesn't everybody that gets out of school in Massachusetts have to pass the standardized test? I don't know. Only public schools. Only public schools. Only public schools. Only public schools. Oh, okay. Okay. The MCAS is gone now. No, it's a common it's, it's But a it, seems, it seems like the state 
would have some they have to they have to pass standards I think now in some states they are more lenient than others because I think the standards are different do vary from state to state um, and the the Schwarzenegger Amish uh, the strictest of them all don't even like um, emphasize learning proper English they don't really care that their young people are not getting a good education and so, you know, when Anna left, she was reading at a fourth grade level. And, um, and uh, Levi Shetler comes from that same area and the same kind of community. And he was barely able to read his mom's letter, you know, for the film. And so it is actually, it varies from that all the way up to where Naomi, who came from Indiana, her Amish school was, was really quite good. She had very little trouble getting her GED because she was well taught. You know, Did so the teachers have any qualifications? No. I, you know, eighth grade education is what you end up with, and that's what you have to go by for your own teaching. I taught for two years. And um, doing it without a without the training was really rough, especially because I had 36 children to start with, uh, four different grades. It was a lot. Yes? Where does the um, whole concept of the Amish come from? Is it based on a spiritual or biblical? Yes, it's basically, uh, they started as Anabaptists back in the Reformation movement in Europe. And um, then later on, there was a split between those who wanted to be more traditional with their dress and things like um, shunning former members and things like that. So um, Jakob Amman was the one who broke away from the others. His followers that were now called Amish. And the others were the Mennonites. Yeah. The, the other interesting thing about the Amish is a lot of their leaders were former members of the Catholic Church in um, either convent, convents or monasteries. So they went by monastic rule. Um, so Benedictine. Well, the, the monastic rule is based on set, um, the Benedictine rule, which is a real strict uh, set of rules that really closely resemble the ordinance that she's talking about. And in it, there are provisions for shunning somebody who you know, starts straying from the monastery. So it's kind of an interesting thing, but you know there are very close ties between the Amish beliefs and some of what the Catholics were doing, and, they, and it was the Catholics they were breaking from in the Reformation. Movement. So somebody way back there had a question. Yes. I was just wondering if there is some sort of philosophy around the education of only of uneducated people. Is there some thinking behind that? You know, I have never. The only thing that I have ever heard as I was growing up is that if you, uh, it's, I think it's a fear that if you go beyond the eighth grade, you will know you have a choice. And that's basically, I think, why. Um, I think it grew out of the fact that a lot of the, during the, uh, you know, when <coughs> agriculture was, when people were, were starting to do other things other than live on the farm, the Amish, who were really focused on the farm, maintained all those things, one of which was child labor. You know, the children had a certain amount of time that they could go to school, but most of it was, you know, they have to go back and do work on the farm during the harvest. And the Amish stuck with that, and the rest of the world moved on. And that's, that's kind of gotten into their education philosophy. It's, kind, it's basically agrarian kind of way of thinking. Okay, so let's see. We have one more with Liz and ask. I just have a question. You were speaking about that David, he wanted to hug you or kiss you, mm -hmm. and you said no, no, no. <laughs> Is it that you grow up very unemotional or that you're emotional? Because he opened up such a world to you, I would imagine you just want to hug him and, you know, <laughs> thank him. Well, I'm just curious. About well, you. well, Schmunzling in the parlor, basically, schmunzling is a, a word, an Amish word for hugging and kissing. So we had been doing 
Well, any of them. <laughs> that was in Burlington. Yeah, that was in Burlington. She got that to her world, and she was living with vendors who were an Amish family. They were kind of in the kitchen, kind of listening to everything. And she knew it. And so she was, she didn't want to take a chance on other people knowing. And then beyond that, I think you really were kind of. Well, because I was thinking, if I am going to stay Amish, then I have to have David as a friend. I cannot allow anything else to come into it. That's really why that why I said no. Okay, so um, all right. So one more question, okay, and yeah. then then we'll um, we'll do the. Well, you've got your little reading. Oh, right, I was going to do the reading. Okay, go ahead. How did they avoid the government regulations, oh. like income tax, things like that, but they pay property taxes? I, I just don't understand how they avoid all the merit of government stuff. Well, because the Social Security Act allows the Amish an exemption. And not for income tax. No, not for income tax. No, they pay that. They pay income tax. And they, have, as social, and they have Social Security numbers and everything? No. Some of them do. See, okay, so the the government has a, has allowed the the Amish an exemption from Social Security. That means they don't have to pay into it, but they also uh, can also not draw from it. Now, some of the more um, progressive Amish are actually getting Social Security numbers, paying into it, and then drawing from it. But if the way it works is those who are the most conservative don't even have social security numbers. Anna, when she went back, she had to be shunned for five and a half months. And a big, a big portion of that was because she had acquired a social security number. And that was very much a no-no in her community. So. Did you have a question? Sure, let's do it. Um, yeah, I was wondering, you talked about the growth of the Amish community. Mm -hmm. Is that just natural birth rate, or is are they do they proselytize? And, I mean, do people yeah. the Amish? So the and question, also, sorry, yeah. Also, is there much movement between the different groups? Ah, uh, okay. So the question is, um, do the Amish uh, proselytize, or why is are, are they growing so fast? They're growing fast by birth rate and they retain the uh, the retention rate. So the estimates by the Young Center is that they will double in size every 20 years if they keep going at this rate. And um, so because they have such a high retention rate, that's, that's why. They do not proselytize, not most of them. Some of them, are, the New Order Amish, are going to tend to do that a little bit more. There are, however, you will not believe how many Requests I keep getting in my email, how can I join the Amish? And all I want to do now is just, you know, I've been ignoring it because what am I going to say? You know, um, and now I just want to say, go watch the Amish shunt. Because two people in that had joined. Well, the mother had joined and the son had to go along and then they both left and the whole family left, as far as I know. Um, that sounds like a really tragic story, the way it was left. And um, people need to know that it is not easy. So no, there is not a whole lot of movement. The only movement there is are those who leave the, the faith. Some of them go back, some do not. OK, so let me do um, one last reading. Um, as I mentioned before, this uh, was sort of my turning point. It was a starlit night in January. And this was about two years after I had left, um, or that I had gone back, rather. I found myself on the Bender's Pond, skating alone. I'd been babysitting on the farm for Yuri's brother's children that night. I remembered another night when the stars were bright, and I was standing in that same yard with David when he had asked for a kiss and a hug, and I had only allowed a handshake. <clears throat> there was something about the snappy cold air and the beauty of the vast sky full of stars that evoked longing in me. 
I had an overwhelming desire to have him skating by my side. I wish David was here now offering that hug. This time I would hug him and I would never let him go. My heart started beating fast in my chest as if it were really happening. I could just feel his arms around me. In that moment I knew that I would one day feel his arms around me again. I also knew who I wanted to spend my life with. Tears spilled down my cheeks and into the scarf I had tied around my neck. I looked up into the starlit sky and I prayed, God, if it's meant to be, then help me find my way back to David. I cannot bear to go through life alone, not having given our love another chance. Thank you.